In this segment, I want to ask this question and deal with it and see if you've ever heard this comment. That's just your interpretation. That's just your interpretation, Mark. Have you ever heard that? Um, how many hundreds of times have you heard that? That's just your interpretation. Um, I'm going to try to deal with two not distinct issues. But, um, they're related. Try to pull them together. This is another issue I want to talk about, and that's how the emergent church has exposed itself to danger by um, falling prey to an issue that we're going to talk about. Anyway, I have heard this many, many times uh, after expressing my views on a particular doctrine or verse or whatever. And what I want to do is ask, what does that mean when people say that's just your interpreta interpretation? Have you ever, you know, thought what people mean when they say that or when <laughs> if you ever said that? Um, I'm sure I have somewhere along the line. Um it, uh, you know, it's the kind of statement where in one fell swoop, somebody can just totally dismiss something that we've just said. You know, it's just, pew, everything that we just said, it'll boom, one fell swoop. Okay, so what does this kind of phrase mean? Well, this, um, you got several possibilities and the first one is uh, well perhaps it means something like this um, because you said it Mark uh, it must be wrong <laughs> because everything you say is wrong um, uh, that's I don't think that's it um, maybe occasionally or once in a while but yes that's, that's that's pretty unkind um, assessment of uh, people's motives and I, I really don't think that's what most people um, mean. The second um, interpretation of that is I don't think you have interpreted the text correctly. That is, I don't think you've got it correct. I, I think uh, I think that I have the correct interpretation, and I think that, Mark, that you have the wrong one. Um, that may be it, and if that's it, then that's, that's cool. However, what worries me, scares me, is that I think there's a third possibility that probably is behind most of those statements of that's just your interpretation and it goes like this what worries me is that folks usually mean something like okay but yeah man that's your interpretation and that's right and okay for you but my interpretation is this and I think it's equally true and Jim's interpretation over there is 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 different from both of ours, but his is just as just as true as well. You know, whatever whatever works for you, whatever you find beneficial and meaningful in your interpretation, and that's cool. So what you have then is different interpretations that are mutually exclusive being stated as equally true. So when someone says that's just your interpretation, what they're saying is that that's true for you, it's just not true for me. And if that is the case, if I'm accurate in my assessment, now I think I am, um, as to the meaning of this when it's uh, said most of the time, 
If that's the case, then what is being proposed is the notion of subjectivism. Now, we talked about that in our two segments on the notion of truth. So what we have here being expressed in that statement is a postmodern view of the concept of truth. There's a difference between the concept of truth and the content of truth. The concept of truth is how we acquire truth and its nature, whether or not truth is absolute and objective or whether or not it's um, relative and um, uh, that sort of thing. So I'll come back to that. But we often take for granted that we're, we're able to have private interpretation of, of the Bible. You know, we all have our own Bibles, but really, I wanted to spend just a few minutes talking about the, one of the most precious legacies of the Reformation is the fact that we have what is known as the right to private interpretation of the Bible. Because prior to the 1500s and the Reformation, the Bible was in Latin and it was interpreted by the Roman magisterium, that is the Pope and his council. But Luther changed all that. And one of the first things he did after he broke with Rome was to hold himself up in a castle and translate the Bible into everyday German. And that was huge. Because I think for about a thousand years, the Vulgate, the, the Bible, uh, I mean, we think that the King James Version has been around for a long time. <laughs> Nothing compared to the uh, Vulgate. I think, it, I think it ran for about a thousand years. So when Luther did this, the Roman Catholic Church howled in protest that he was making it available uh, to the man on the street. Um, and it's not, I really don't think it's, they howled in protest just because folks would be bypassing Rome. That's part of it. But they were seriously and sincerely concerned and afraid that private interpretation of the Bible would lead to anarchy of the Bible, that sects and bizarre interpretations of the Bible would proliferate all kinds of bizarre views. And you know what? Their fears were justified. Luther himself was distressed about this possibility, uh, but he knew that getting the Bible and the gospel into people's hands was worth the, the risk. And um, again, the concern of Rome and Luther was that putting the Bible into our hands would open a floodgate of iniquity, and their fears were well founded. And I want to talk about an example of that shortly, but I'm sure you can think of many of your own. Um, there are countless denominations which are usually based on difference of interpretation of the Bible on the color of the carpet in the sanctuary. <laughs> no, something a little bit more sus substantive than that, but often not much. Um, in this context, uh, there's a point that I want to make uh, emphatic, and that is that there's only one correct interpretation of any given text. Remember our opening question, question was, or statement, that's your interpretation of the Bible. Well, the Bible's view of itself as being absolute and objective 
implies that there can only be one correct interpretation of any given text, but countless applications. Sometimes folks get those two uh, confused, application and meaning, but um, they're distinct, but they're not separated. Um, when I when I or you, when we interpret a passage of scripture, I either interpret it rightly or I interpret it wrongly. Um, that's what objective truth implies. And the reason we insist on only one correct interpretation is because God's word is not contradictory. Truth is is not contradictory. The Holy Spirit is the main author of the Bible. He is the author of truth. He is the spirit of truth. He doesn't speak with a forked tongue. He doesn't speak out of both sides of his mouth. And if we deny um, that the Bible uh, is not contradictory, then the whole authority of the Bible is undermined. God's truthfulness in communicating truth to us is undermined. So, the right to private interpretation carries with it the responsibility of correct interpretation. Let me say that again. The right to private interpretation carries with it the responsibility of correct interpretation. And you have the difference a crucial difference between what is known as exegesis, the uh, Greek word ex means out of, or in this case exegesis would mean reading out of the text the meaning, which is the proper way to read the Bible, versus what is known as isogesis. And ice in Greek means into. And uh, I said Jesus is reading into the text our prior assumptions. And we all have done that um, wittingly or unwittingly uh, at times. Um, but we need to avoid that. Now, we live in a culture in which there has been a radical transformation in the concept of truth, as I alluded to. The concept of truth, a little repetition here, is not the same as the content of truth. The concept of truth is not the same as the content of truth. The concept of truth is how we view truth in general, how we acquire it, and the nature of truth. Is it objective or subjective? Is it absolute or is it relative? Okay, that's, the con that's the concept of truth that has changed in the last hundred years or so. The content of truth is what we believe. Okay. Now, though these two are distinct, the concept and the, and the content, they are not separated. Because if one believes in truth is objective and absolute, then there can be only one correct interpretation. But if truth is subjective and relative, then the Bible has as many meanings as you want it to. Whatever feels right or works for you is true. It gets back to the whole deconstruction thing that was popular in academics for a while. So, um, the notion of truth that we're talking about now is a consequence of living in our times of postmodernism. And Christians need to come to grips with the culture in which we are living. And the Bible continuously warns us against what is known as syncretism. Syncretism comes from the Greek word. Um, sun, which means with, um, and syncretism means 
um, the blending together, pulling together um, of truth and error. Or put another way, it's the blending of the truth of the Bible with the false teaching of other religions. And just a cursory study of the Old Testament, well, you'll see that from the very beginning, syncretism, the blending of the, the truth of worshiping Yahweh, um, was uh, mixed with worship of Baal. And God was concerned with that from the very beginning. In the Old Testament, right from the outset, right from the get-go, God's people were warned um, about not mixing the truth with the error. And if you think about it, the, the first and second commandments expressly deal with this concern. You'll have no other gods before me and no images. Um that deals at least in part with not mixing God with any other false gods. And that was, in Deuteronomy, which I'm reading in my devotionals, gosh, they were told over and over again to avoid the temptation, uh, the wow factor of Baal worship, because today, just like then, Satan will promise immediate um, type supernatural experience that offers what I call the wow factor, that Im immediacy of supernatural experience that overwhelms the senses and um, gives us instant gratification. And it's, it's just so addictive and so uh, magnetic of a draw. We're told um, you know, entire nations were to be devoted to God, that is, wiped out, because uh, they, God knew that they would pose a threat to Israel's purity of worship, and he did not want syncretistic worship. But it wasn't, it wasn't long before Israel uh, degenerated into syncretism, where they blended um, worship of Yahweh with Baal worship, you know, they would mix them together. You know, they became fascinated with uh, Asherah or Baal, and it was just a constant problem in the Old Testament. And you had the, um, the bane of the Old Testament people was the false prophets. Uh, they were a continual thorn. And, uh, Israel side. And then when you look in the New Testament, we see the exact same problem of syncretism. Jesus and the apostles were constantly warning folks against the dangers of syncretistic false teachers in their false teaching. I mean, over and over again. From Matthew to the book of Revelation, where in the first you know, we're talking about the seven churches and they're admonished, for example, for mixing their beliefs with the Nicolaitans, which God said he hated. He actually uses that word. So syncretism or this tendency of ours to mix the truth of the Bible, um, God does not look upon that with favor. Um, he wants pure worship spirit and in truth so syncretism is a problem with us today as well so let me give you an example um, that i heard recently and this is what i'm trying to, to bring together two issues in in a single video and i hope it's it works out there's a movement that's called the emergent church you ever heard of that the emergent church Okay, well, one brother uh, was 
bearing his heart in anguish. And he said that he was, he had been accused recently of, quote, living in fear by other Christians because he, he warned these Christians who were in the emergent church about the dangers of mixing their faith with New Age practices and beliefs, and that this would very likely open them to demonic influence. He wasn't hammering over the head. He was just gently warning them of the truth. And their response was they told him that since Christians are covered in the blood of Jesus and uh, saved by his grace, then they did not have anything to worry about um, coming under demonic attack because Jesus had uh, defeated the evil one. They were done with that. So they were chastising this guy. Uh, and any they told him that any focus on danger was legalistic, and fear-inducing. So here you have a guy who, out of the love in his heart, was gently um, trying to warn these people, and then they turn it on him and say that he's trying to induce fear into um, their hearts. They see that's what happens with syncretism and with a watered-down view of truth. It, it brings in its wake a heart and a mind that's given to syncretism since there are no clear doctrinal boundaries. Um, and I'll talk more about what emergent church means in just a moment. Um and these uh, folks in the emergent church, they appealed to where Paul said to Timothy, we have not received a spirit of fear, but of power. Um, you're going to see that they uh, misquoted that. But with this kind of syncretistic... Um, some call it hyper grace, but it's, it's more of a, an issue of watering down the notion of truth, as, as we're going to see um, how the emergent ch church views uh, truth itself. Um, but the result is that with this mindset, any verse can mean anything to anyone. Say it again, with this syncretistic mindset, any verse can mean anything to anyone. And so they felt free to mess as Christians, okay? Because of the fact that, that they were covered in the blood, they felt free to mess with things like meditation, yoga, um, you fill in the blank, just other occult practices, um, because they felt like they were untouchable from the evil one. They were free in Christ and covered by his grace and blood. <sighs> but if, had they just thought for a moment, nobody, nobody warned more against the danger of the cult, the occult more than the apostle of grace himself, Paul. You know, Paul is known as the as apostle of grace, but he warned over and over and over again about, as we're going to see when we read some verses, about the dangers of Christians um, messing with the occult. So where, where are these folks being influenced by? Um, what, what is this thing called the emergent church? And um, by the way, it's, they're by, not, not by any means the only influence uh, on 
people having a um, uh, subjectivistic uh, view of uh, interpreting the Bible. It's just um, I'm picking on them because of they're the ones who discuss with uh, our friend and um, uh, they're growing pretty fast and they are um, they have a lot of influence so let me, let me talk about that for a moment em the term emerging and emergent are actually distinct and um, and they need to be distinct because they, they are distinguished. And at risk of oversimplifying, let me just say this. Emergent or the emergent church is a reaction amongst mostly 20 to 30 year olds against several things that they see wrong in the traditional church. On the one hand, there's a reaction against the what they call the plastic Mega churches where relationships are downplayed um, and the focus seems to be on the bigness of the churches, the uh, success of the churches, the uh, um, worldly marketing practices, uh, just the plasticness, um, to borrow a term from the 60s. Uh, Boy, that brought back memories because uh, I think Jimi Hendrix has a, a lyric in which he says, talking about pointing your plastic finger at me. So um, they want to be more free to express their creativity within their local church. They want to see introduce the arts and poetry. Um, they want to have the freedom to worship at home, to sit in circles if on the floor if they want to, or in couches with candles lit and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, honestly, thus far, and I'm speaking as a former pastor, I don't see any issues with that. In fact, I think creativity should, should be very highly valued and celebrated and expressed in the local church. We should support our artists. Um, and not just, you know, those who paint pictures of Jesus either. Um, so we should celebrate. Of all people, we should celebrate creativity. However, the big problem that I have with the emergent church is this. And that is uh, a reaction to formalized doctrinal statements they can't handle that at all um, they think that doctrine divides um, they have a dismissive attitude towards truth that's what most concerns me about the emergent church is its dismissive attitude towards truth in general uh, they do not see truth as objective. They are true children of postmodernism, and they're not taking any steps to get out of it. And they don't see, not only do they not see truth as objective, but they don't see how truth from God can be expressed propositionally, that is, in meaningful sentences. So as I said, they're true children of postmodernism and syncretism to boot. So to get them to define to define truth is like nailing uh, jello to the wall. It's it's impossible. Um, so again, syncretism is a blending of truth uh, with the lies, and that has uh, you know, the emergent church is part of the church. So this should be of something of particular concern for because these are our brothers and sisters. And right now I don't see any uh, slacking off. Okay, so now because of this lack of zeal for truth, 
They can get really agitated when believers warn them of occult practices and beliefs which may cause them harm. Uh, like my my uh, the guy I, I mentioned just a moment ago. Um, as a, just to, to repeat, a brother shared that he had warned some folks in, in an emergent uh, church circles of how certain New Age practices would harm them and their families. But he was rebuffed, as I said, because he was told that these Christians had nothing to fear since they were covered in the blood and the devil had no hold over them regardless of what they did or believed. And that he was just responding in fear due to his being negative. Um, which is like the cardinal sin. You don't be negative. And don't be negative. And then, of course, besides, that's just your interpretation, man. Um, you're going to cause bad, bad vibes or negative vibes around here. Kind of sounds bit new age, doesn't it? So this brother's attempts to gently point out their problems were thrown back into his face and seen as a lack of faith and living in a spirit of fear and not a spirit of faith and power and grace. And any response was likely met with, that is your interpretation, man. So how do we reply? Well, some observations. Um, their lack of leaning on the truth as truth, objective truth, is frightening. It truly really is. Because it's opened them up to all sorts of potential syncretism. And as the devil is good at anything, it is lying. Do you remember the first thing, the first recorded words of the devil are in the Bible? Did God say? Uh, he is so good with blending 95% truth with 5% error. And that 5% error will act like leaven that will ruin people for eternity. It was to believers, it was to believers that the apostles aimed their passionate pleas to stay uncorrupted by the world. It was by the apostles aimed at believers with their passionate pleas to stay away from darkness. It was to believers that Jesus and the apostles pled with them to stay away from the occult. Um, with the emergent church, the big thing, again, is uh, another thing, is personal relationships and missions. But truth means very little to them. Um I feel sorry for the my uh, my friend that went through this uh, situation because it's apparently not uh, a one-time thing. It's a, a pattern where he is rebuffed uh, repeatedly. This is a clear example of believers syncretizing their beliefs with concepts of truth, which are foreign to the Bible. If believers are immune. If believers are immune to Satan's attacks, then why are we constantly warned to be on guard, to be vigilant, and to be aware of Satan's schemes? If we're immune to Satan's attacks, then why are we warned about the danger of opening up demonic doors, giving the devil a foothold, etc.? Let me read some verses real quick, if I may. Um, 
Ephesians 4, 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. The word opportunity there is topos in the Greek. And that, what, I, what I take that to mean, and I'm going to say this is my interpretation uh, in a subjective way, I really think the correct interpretation is that he's basically saying, don't give the devil a foothold um, that very likely may lead to oppression. Okay, you got you know there's steps the the demonic take. You got the infestation, which begins with the sticking of the foot through the door, and it just builds. And Paul says, "Give no opportunity to the devil." Now he's speaking to the Ephesians who are believers, and he's telling them, "Don't give the devil an opportunity." And one way they can be done is by letting your going to bed. For example, husband and wife anger at each other. Don't do that. Please. Or with anybody. At least say you're sorry, you know, talk about it in the morning. But And then, uh, next verse I'd like to, uh, is, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay, that's First John. So if if we have, you know, God's grace and, and the blood of Jesus that protects us, then we don't have to worry about any. Um, we can do basically whatever we want because we're protected by the blood. And why is, is John telling us to test every spirit? We don't have, we wouldn't have to test any spirit. We could just go our merry way. But John is very keen that we test them or we'll be in trouble. Why? Because some of the teachers were animated by the demonic. Okay, then um, from 1 Timothy so that we may no longer be children, listen to this, tossed to and fro, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Okay, I didn't read the, the context, contextual verses that came before it, but um, I was talking about pastors equipping us so that through teaching so that we would not be tossed to and fro by false teaching and every fad or doctrine that came around by the evil one and then first timothy 4 1 through 2 it says now the spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and to teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Okay, there's the threat of people departing from the faith. Now, that's a real clear and present danger there. That's about as um, dangerous as you can get, departing from the faith. That's apostasy. So that just really, again, flies in the face of the notion that we can just walk around. Um, you know, it's one thing to have confidence in the Spirit, that he who is in us is greater than he was in the world. That's, that's one thing. We are more than conquerors in Christ, but it is absolutely devastating to have a presumptuous uh, notion that we can even dabble uh, um if we want to into certain things because Christ uh, will protect us. Um, now that's, that is presumption. And then speaking from Colossians, it says, t um, these are commands to believers again. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Elemental spirits is a synonym for demons. Okay. 
the implication is that one can be taken captive by philosophy if you're not careful. Um, and then we come lastly to the classic text in um, Ephesians. If we are, if we become a Christian and all we have to do is, um, if we, if, if as when we come to know the Lord, the grace of Jesus and the blood of Christ, if it covers us and we don't really have to worry about what we believe or what we do, um, then why would Paul go into great detail and say, finally, be strong in the Lord and in strength of his might. Put on, why would he say each day, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand to get the schemes of the devil. Four, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. This is the command to stand firm, put on, um, I can read the whole thing, but put on each aspect of the panoply of the um, full armor of God. And um, that's the biblical picture of spiritual warfare and, and, and not this false um, super spiritual notion that uh, basically passivity that we can, um, because of what Jesus has done, that we can just um, let our guard down and do as we please. You know, join the, the local uh, meditation group, and, and, and while we're at it, um, maybe get a, a um, energy healing uh, while we're at it. Uh, you know, where Paul told Timothy to not be fearful, uh, which they had kind of tossed in his face several times, the idea of being fearful was being involved in the struggle against darkness. In other words, Paul was saying to Timothy, don't be fearful of of this of this battle um be a be a courageous soldier it has nothing to do with with what the emergent church folks were that were talking to to this guy about um he paul was just urging him to be a courageous soldier in this battle uh but you know to dismiss uh it is a sure way to come under its influence. In fact, this notion that was expressed is itself a, uh, to me, that these people are, are to some extent un already under demonic influence. The verses that I read are just a tiny, tiny sampling of God's many pleas in the Old and New Testament to interpret the Bible carefully, correctly, and to not to revert to syncretistic practices, which will put you in harm's way. And I mean in harm's way. Um, syncretism can cause God to be jealous. It can grieve the Holy Spirit. It can give the devil a foothold to demonic oppression. And it can also uh, enable or make us susceptible to being led astray. Between my dear friends and, and myself, as well as other people who involved in uh, deliverance ministry, who we've helped believers, underline the word believers, um, countless folks who profess Christ with demonic oppression, okay, 
Yes, some of the folks we've helped have been non-Christians, but there have been countless believers that have come under such severe demonic oppression. Uh, it's unspeakable. And it was often due to messing with the cold things that they thought that they were immune to since they were Christians. That is, they had bought into the same lie that uh, the emergent church guys were telling them was kind of about. If being saved by grace was a guarantee that we're immune to all of Satan's attacks, then why all the warnings? You know, the struggle against the world, the flesh, and the devil will not end until we die or Jesus comes back, whichever comes first. So the issue regarding interpretation of the Bible and syncretism is really the same issue. Will we bow before the authority of God through his holy word and not presume upon his grace? Um, God warns us because he loves us and he knows how serious misinterpretations of the Bible can be the consequences and how serious the consequences can be living with false views of grace and false views of living in the victory that Christ has won for us and until we die we are in a battle royal and just speaking from my heart as I close, uh, I just think of the the dear people that um, I've had the, the privilege of knowing and seeing the absolute wide awake nightmare that these tr true Christians were dealing with because somebody in the family opened up a forbidden door. And their lives became a wide, a wide awake nightmare. And uh, the most horrible things began to happen. Uh, supernatural. Uh, yeah, you call them signs and wonders. But it's not the kind of things that you want to, to happen. Being scratched and pulled out of bed. And that sort of thing. Um, so, God's word is truth. There's one meaning, and we need to take his truth seriously and um, to rejoice in his victory on the cross and to fight the good fight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, which you have graciously given us the truth, the sword of the Spirit. And I ask, Lord, that you would help to use these um, stumbling words of mine to uh, help someone who needs to hear these words to bring some clarity, some direction, some guidance, some healing. And Lord, we give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.